Alright then, another year, another Doom game. Or actually, another 12 years. Doom released on May 13th, 2016 to critical acclaim, and sold over 3.6 million copies by the end of 2016. The game was praised by pretty much everyone who had played it for its use of classic Doom's gameplay, with modern elements implemented into the game really well, and the single player is considered to be one of the best of the 2010s. The soundtrack by Mick Gordon was also praised for giving a modern take on Doom's music that pays respect to the original games. The multiplayer on the other hand bombed hard with fans, who complained about it being too similar to other games like Halo or Call of Duty. Snap Map was an interesting mode which allowed players to create their own maps and transform the game in any way they see fit. So overall, Doom was considered a success. Apart from that fucking name. Okay, this isn't exclusive just to Doom, but why does every reboot have to use the exact same title as the original? It just makes it confusing, because now I have to specify whether I'm talking about the 1993 Doom or the 2016 Doom. Like, do you want us to forget the originals existed? Do you want us to act as if this is the first one? Clearly not, by how much influence this game takes from the originals and how much homage it pays to them. <sighs> Hell, I would have preferred something cheesy like Doom Road to Hell or anything, just anything would be better than just Doom. There's already a game called Doom and it's in the same fucking series. Anyway, to celebrate Doom's, the 1993 Doom's, 26th anniversary, and until Doom Eternal releases, I thought, why not cover this entry in the series? Should also be mentioned that I won't be talking about the multiplayer in this video, I don't have much interest in it, and it wouldn't make for an interesting video. Alright then, so like most games nowadays, Doom starts off with a 15 hour long cutscene of full of exposition. Okay, I guess not. Alright, so it actually starts off with someone telling you to rip and tear until it is done, and then you wake up chained to a sarcophagus with demons all around you. Doom Guy makes quick work of them before a hologram shows Olivia Pierce, the antagonist, talking about whether containing the sarcophagus while other UAC members are praying to you. I mean, this opening is pretty cool because it establishes how powerful the Doom Guy is, all by showing and not telling. Doom Guy then gets in his fancy new armor as he gets contacted by Dr. Samuel Hayden. Welcome. I'm Dr. Samuel Hayden. I'm the head of this facility. I think we can work together and resolve this problem in a way that benefits us both. And this is one of the many aspects I like about Doom, is that despite Doom Guy literally being just a pair of arms, id Software is able to inject so much character into him. I love the way he throws the monitor across the room like fuck off, it's too early for exposition. Doom Guy then gets a shotgun and clears out another room of demons before then seeing another hologram of Olivia showing a concern of Doom Guy's power before then making it into an elevator. I'm willing to take full responsibility for the horrible events of the last 24 hours, but you must understand our interest in their world was purely for the betterment of mankind. Everything has clearly gotten out of hand. This scene is another great example of storytelling. Samuel is trying to convince Doomguy that their work was trying to better human life, but then Doomguy sees a dead body right next to him, and realises that Samuel is full of shit, and he isn't having any of it. And then we get the title screen with a cool ass remix of the E1M1. Gotta say, it's a pretty good opening. It gets the player introduced to the gameplay mechanics in a natural way. The pacing allows the player to just immediately drop into the game, 
and the game is able to establish the character of Doom Guy, Samuel Hayden, and Olivia Pierce, and all their motivations, all with showing and not telling, and doing so in a very subtle and engaging way. Speaking of the gameplay mechanics, that's what Doom is all about, so I should get into that. So I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with the gameplay of Doom and its chest-like design. You are the Doom Guy and have a variety of different weapons, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and you fight a variety of demons, all of which have their own strengths and weaknesses. What makes Doom so fun is that despite being a run-and-gun type of game, there is critical thinking involved in order to beat the demons, involving weapon and target prioritization. The game uses a bunch of different combinations of enemies, which offers the player different ways to use their weapons and fight the demons. Combined with level design that encourages and rewards exploration with new items and secrets, Every Doom game has had this so far, and so does Doom 2016. Doom does a really good job updating the core gameplay of the original games for a modern shooter, even if it does kind of ignore the general philosophy of the originals. It also does a great job of adding in more modern elements. So let's start off with the weapons. They're mostly well handled. The shotgun is obviously good for close range combat, but the delay in between shots leaves you open for an attack. The super shotgun does twice the damage, but has a longer delay in between shots. The machine gun has good accuracy, but the shots are somewhat dodgeable by enemies. The plasma rifle does a crap ton of damage, but once again, the projectiles can be dodged. The chain gun does a shit ton of damage, but drains ammo fast. The RPG does a shit ton of damage, but can also cause splash damage for the player, so it can hurt you just as much as it hurts the demons. The gas cannon does a lot of damage and is very precise, but has a big delay in between shots. The chainsaw kills anything in one hit, but needs fuel to do so. The BFG can kill a huge group of enemies at once, but you only get three shots at once. What this means is that the player cannot consistently rely on one weapon all the time, and they will have to change up their weapons in order to be effective in combat, and it encourages the player to try out new abilities with the weapons. Oh yeah, that's something that should be mentioned. Doom allows you to upgrade your weapons, such as grenade launcher for the shotgun, a scope for the machine gun, a lock-on for the RPG, a pl 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 what? A pulse blast for the plasma rifle, or a mobile turret for the chain gun. There are two different attachments for each weapon, except the pistol, and they are a lot of fun to use. What I do appreciate about these upgrades is that while they do give the player a lot more freedom and creative opportunities with the weapons, they don't fundamentally change how the weapons work. The functionality of all the weapons remains consistent throughout the game, which is important because if the weapons are inconsistent, then the balancing for all of them goes out the fucking window, and whatever purpose they were supposed to serve in the game is now meaningless due to them working in a completely different way. Doom very much avoids this. They even have some challenges to increase the effectiveness of the upgrades, which also encourages players to try out different ways to fight the demons in combat. If I did have any criticisms with the weapons, I think the plasma rifle is a bit too weightless compared to the rest of the guns. Like, it's one of the most powerful guns in the game, yet it never feels powerful. Now, it's hard to describe how something feels, but with a gun like the chain gun, there's a certain kick to it that makes it feel like you're firing a fucking nuclear bomb at the demons. Maybe there just isn't enough recoil? I'm not sure, but it doesn't feel very responsive. I also do feel as if the sound effect for the rocket launcher isn't loud enough, and thus it makes the gun feel weak when it isn't. Compare the sound effects from the original game to the new one. In fact, I would also say the shotgun and machine gun suffer from this same issue. I also think the siege attachment for the Goss Cannon is really fucking stupid. It stops you dead in your tracks, which goes against the game's design of always staying on the move. You can upgrade it enough so that you can move around whilst using it, but who is going to want to use a gun that stops them dead in their fucking tracks while they're chasing demons? Who the hell wants that? All in all, I think the weapons in the game are done quite well, but eh, there are a few aspects of them which I think could have been changed. 
Onto the demons, I think they're done really well, and each of them provide a different challenge to the player. There are just random members of the UAC facility who got turned into demons or some shit. They're mostly just there so the player can glory kill them to get some health. The imps are very fast and agile and can throw fireballs at you, but are very weak. The soldiers do have ranged attacks, but those attacks can be dodged, and they are also kind of slow. The Hell Knight is a fast motherfucker who delivers quite a lot of heavy damage, but he has no ranged attacks, and all of his attacks are dodgeable. The Pinky Demon is armored everywhere except its back. It can run at the player and delivers quite a heavy blow if they do hit the player, but it can also be easily outmaneuvered. There is a partially invisible version called the Spectre from the original game, but this version has no armor. The Revenant is mostly a support demon who fires rockets at the player, when you combine him with a group of demons, he's a deadly foe, but on his own, he really can't pull his own weight. The Mancubus fires really fast projectiles at you, and they can take you out really quick, but they're also very slow and don't have much mobility. There is a new enemy called the Summoner, which is kind of a replacement of the Archvile. It can resurrect a dead demon near it, it can send out a huge blast wave similar to the Archvile's fire wave, but it is a stationary enemy that teleports, from point to point, unlike the Arch Vial, which does whatever the fuck it wants, I guess. The Kako Demon returns, which is an air enemy, breaking up the tradition of enemies always being on the ground. And finally, there is the Baron of Hell, which is the toughest common enemy in the game. Its melee attacks and fireballs do an insane amount of damage, but its attacks are the most telegraphed out of any enemy, so it's easy to tell what type of attack he's about to do. What I do like about Doom is that unlike the other games in the series, pretty much all the enemies have projectile based attacks, or at least attacks that are telegraphed and can be dodged, meaning that if you do take damage, 90% of the time it's your own fault. So the game is well balanced in that regard. I don't really have much complaints with the enemies, I think the Lost Souls are really annoying because they can just ram into you like all the other games. Why did, the, why did 90s first person shooters have like really fucking annoying enemies? Other than that though, all the enemies are challenging, but offer a fair and beatable challenge, and the way each encounter chooses to vary up the combination of enemies always switches up the way you'll fight them. There are three boss fights in this game, and they're pretty great too. The Cyber Demon is a sort of David and Goliath situation where his attacks do more damage, but you have more attacks. Every one of his attacks is very deadly, but they can be dodged. The Hell Guards is cool because it starts off as a 1v1, but then a 1v2. The list of abilities they have will make the player think quickly on their feet, and it is a very challenging fight. The Spider Demon, or Spider Mastermind, puts out a list of attacks to the player, and the player has to learn the pattern of the attacks to beat it off, and it does feel quite rewarding to figure out this semi-puzzle, I guess. There are other aspects, uh, such as player upgrades, which allow you to recharge equipment faster, switch weapons faster, reduce splash damage, make you immune to explosive barrel damage, yada yada. These upgrades take Praetor Suit tokens, which can be found on random dead UAC soldiers around the facility. There are plenty of secrets to find within the levels, such as these little Doom guys, which unlock viewable character models. There are Argent Cells, which allow you to increase your health armor and ammo bar. My favorite is these levers, leathers, which unlock uh, some levels from the original Doom. And these are really fun, even if the uh, the new enemy design doesn't really work too well with the original levels. There's key cards which allow you to find weapons faster, there's audio and text logs which help find more information on the demons in the UAC base, as well as the characters in the game. There are these runes which give challenges for the player to complete, and rewards them with a special ability like being able to run faster after a glory kill or having demons drop armor when you kill them. There are some easter eggs and these all just make the levels really fun to explore. In fact I'd say this game easily has the best exploration in the entire series. I like the power ups too, they each give the player a really awesome power drive trip and they can get you out of some very sticky situations. I also do like the glory kill system because the animations are brutal and over the top, as Doom should be. However, if I did have any major problems with Doom 2016 is that it gets very repetitive. Every combat encounter has almost the exact same design where you go into a room, kill every demon in the room, 
and then the door to the next room opens. Rinse and repeat. There is some combat that does take place outside, but most of the combat is in actual arenas, for the most part. It's serious Sam-like in a way. Which is very unlike the original games, because the original Doom games were a maze full of monsters, whereas Doom 2016 is an arena full of monsters. The main issue with me though is that this makes the level design in the arenas very uninspired and too similar, and it makes the game feel very samey after a while. Look at the original Doom games, the combat can take place in a bunch of different types of level design areas to keep the levels from getting mundane. That was some really fucking poor writing on the script, what the fuck was I trying to say there? With Doom, all the arenas are designed like a multiplayer map, and it does often feel like you're not making much progression. In the original games, there was some sections where you have to kill a room of demons before you can progress, but for the most part, it's a maze full of demons you can continue through at whatever pace you want. Whereas in Doom, you're locked off in an arena for minutes on end, just fighting demons, and it does mean the game can get repetitive, since each level is filled with these types of areas. And also, some of the glory kill animations can get repetitive too, so this doesn't help either. Another thing that can wear on the player is that, with a few exceptions, the game never really gets more intense as it goes along. The game starts out pretty fucking intense and brutal, and it stays that way throughout, so it can get tiring after a while. This is one thing I do appreciate about Doom 3. Even though it did have a slow start, the game kept building as it went along, and thus it kept me engaged. The original games did it too. The game would start off relatively tame, and then reach levels of insaneness, whereas Doom is just insane right off the start. It's why I have to play this game in bursts, because the level design and overall pace of the game can just get very tiring after a while. I'm not saying Doom needed to slow down or anything, what I'm saying is that it should have started off at a more buildable level. Either way, Doom is a pretty fucking awesome in the gameplay department. The weapons are fun to use and have a great variety, the enemies all pose a challenging but fair fight, the levels are fun to explore, and the secrets are pretty awesome too. It's just that the game can get too repetitive, and I hope this is something they fix with Eternal. Surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, depending on your reaction to Doom 3, Doom has much less of a story focus this time around. Many people even go as far to say that this game doesn't even have a story, which I find strange because while there isn't that much that happens in the story itself, there is quite a lot of lore in the game, and even then I think the story in the game itself works fine enough. The thing is, I think id Software wanted to appeal to both those who don't give a shit about the story in Doom and those who do, and I think they found a pretty good middle ground. Basically, there is a lot of environmental storytelling and visual storytelling in the game which doesn't interrupt gameplay for those who don't care, but provides information for those who do. Everything in the Doom universe, every item, demon, character, location, whatever, does have a story about it, but it's up to the player if they want to find out or not. There are quite a lot of text logs which provide information on pretty much everything in the game, and there are the Slayer Testaments which provide backstory for the Doom guy. There are holograms throughout the game, which show previous events and the conflict between Samuel and Olivia, and also the backstory of the UAC. There's actually quite a lot of story established in the game, so I'll go through the basics. Basically, Doom Guy, or the Doom Slayer as he's known now, is basically a fucking badass demon slaying machine, who has crossed between dimensions killing the demons, and even has the highest ranking demons shit themselves just thinking about him. He even took down the titan with his bare hands. How the fuck did he do that? He even became head of the Night Sentinels, which was like a demon fighting cult or realm of whatever the fuck it was. They fought demons. At some point, though, the demons realized they weren't able to beat this motherfucker, so they decided to lay a trap for him and contain him in a sarcophagus and burn his symbol on it, warning all the demons to stay away from the Doom Slayer as he rests there in eternal suffering. At some point though, the UAC decided to go to hell and use its energy as a resource, and they came back with many artifacts, including the Doom Slayer. The UAC also did manage to capture some demons for testing. While Samuel did agree that humanity could use some of Hell's resources, he also did realize the risks and so he kept the Doom Slayer as a backup plan if anything went wrong. Lo and behold, an outbreak happens and 60% of the facility gets killed by demons, and then the other 40% gets turned into demons. Samuel then releases the Doomslayer, and slowly convinces the Slayer to help him. 
What I do find interesting is that even though there are only four characters in the game, well actually three really, the Doomslayer, Samuel, Olivia, if you want to count Vega, they each provide a different and unique perspective. The Slayer is all about killing demons and destroying hell. Samuel thinks that the Doomslayer isn't necessarily wrong in his methods, but thinks hell is too big of a resource to throw away. And Olivia is just full-blown, demonic-level, fucking crazy-ass shit. And I like that even though the Slayer and Samuel work together, there is clearly some conflict between the two. The destruction of the Argent Tower is... devastating. But... I am committed to helping you close the portal. Sometimes the Slayer just outright ignores Samuel's directives. We are only temporarily disabling the tower. You need to remove each lens individually. Carefully release the hinges. Warning. Energy contamination detected. Destroying the production of Argent energy isn't necessary. Vega is an AI which doesn't really favor the Slayer or Samuel. The main objective of the entire game is to shut down the portal to hell that Olivia opens and kill her. Vega only assists both characters with that objective. I think this works for the simplistic story because each character has their own clear motives for why they do what they do, and there is always some interesting conflict going on between them. So I think the story itself works well. There are a bunch of interesting theories that the Doom Slayer is actually the original Doom guy from the original games, which I'm not sure is true or not. I mean, the universe in this Doom is quite different from the original universe. Like, the UAC, for example, is now a religious, hell-based organization, whereas in the original games, it was just a research center. And there really isn't that much evidence to suggest that the Doom Slayer is the Doom guy. There is this scripture of the Slayer wearing armor similar to the first, but it might just be an easter egg, not a canonical reference. I mean, there's no mention of any UAC bases that got destroyed, previously, or even the events of Doom 2, where hell was on Earth. I mean, Doom 1 and 2 were set around 100 years before Doom 2016, but you'd think something that would be as big as that would be reference. I mean, there is kind of a direct reference to Doom 3 though, as in Olivia Pierce's office you can find the Soul Cube, which is strange, but once again I don't know if this is canon, or if this is just a reference. There have also been comparisons made between Doom 64 and Doom, where at the end of Doom 64, Doom Guy stays in hell to stop the demons ever escaping it again, and many people believe that the Doom Guy remained in hell and then became head of the Night Sentinels, destroyed all the fucking demons, then got uh, contained in the sarcophagus and then, you know, trapped for however, however long. I, I don't fucking know. I don't necessarily believe that. Samuel does say the Slayer is the only flesh and blood to walk between dimensions. So I guess this could work, I guess the other Doom games are just in different dimensions, it's the same protagonist. I don't know. Basically what I'm saying is that the Doom Slayer being the original Doom guy is possible, but there isn't really enough evidence for me to draw a conclusion. Id Software has confirmed though that this will be answered in Doom Eternal. Anyway, long tangent over, I just wanted to discuss the theory. Either way, Doom does have quite a lot of lore for those who want to dive into it, However, none of it is thrown in your face, and you're free to explore as much of the backstory as you want. If you're someone who just wants to shoot shit, then you can just play through the game, no issue. Anyway, after leaving the sarcophagus of the Slayer needs to meet up with Samuel Hayden, as at this point in the story, he has no idea what's going on, and needs to figure out what's going on. After doing some more busy work, the Slayer arrives at the Argent Tower, where Olivia is trying to open another portal to hell. She succeeds, and the Slayer is back in hell for a short time. While we're here though, I do find Doom's hell much less interesting visually than Doom 3's hell. Doom 3's hell was very atmospheric, with lots of sounds and screaming and moaning and crying, constantly following the player, making them feel on edge. And I love the contrast with all the colours of orange lava, dark brick hallways and green fire, and all the structures and skulls everywhere. Doom's hell is just very brown, pretty much everywhere. While the story inside Hell is more interesting, it just looks like a bunch of brown rocks with red energy coming out of them. There is some interesting structures in Hell, but it is much less memorable than the Hell in Doom 3. I think it's mostly because in Doom 3 you don't visit Hell until like 10 hours into the game, and the whole time it's built up to be the baddest motherfucker ever, and then when you finally get there you see why. You only visit Hell twice in Doom 3, yet both visits are memorable, 
and leave an impact on you. In Doom, you visit hell in like the first two hours, and I get it, both are very different types of games with very different pacing, but I just find Doom 3's hell more unique and visually interesting. Anyway, Samuel then tells the Slayer to head to the Advanced Research Complex to find an artifact with the Slayer symbol on, and tells him that they will need the Crucible in order to close the portal. On the way, Samuel installs a tethering device into the Slayer's armor so he can be pulled back from hell. Anyway, they destroy Vega, which outputs enough power for the Slayer to be sent back to hell, although the Slayer does copy Vega, and he will be back in Eternal. The Slayer then uses the Crucible to free the souls of the Rafts, and then helps close the portal. The Slayer then beats the Spider Demon and gets pulled back to Mars. You've won. It's over. You stopped the invasion and closed the portal. But it's come at a price. Argent. Vega. This entire operation. So we have stopped the invasion, but Samuel now confronts Doom Guy about his methods. You see, I've watched your work. Come to understand your motivation. You think the only way is to kill them all, leave nothing behind. And you may be right, but we can't just shut it all down. But with this, we can continue our work. I am not the villain in this story. I do what I do because there is no choice. Our time is up. I can't kill you, but I won't have you standing in our way. Until we see each other again. Which sets up an interesting conflict for the two in the sequel. Oh, and I don't mind this game ending on a cliffhanger because there is a conclusion to this story. The portal is closed and the invasion is stopped. There is progression and we completed our goals throughout the game. So this chapter of the story is complete and now it's on to the next chapter. Overall, Doom has a very simplistic story, but it works well enough for keeping the players who want one engaged and also appealing to those who don't want one. And I really like the conflicts portrayed with Samuel and Olivia, as well as Samuel and the Slayer. So overall, Doom has a solid story. Alright, so, Mick Gordon is the composer of Doom 2016. Gordon has risen to fame quite quickly with him doing the soundtracks for other Bethesda properties such as Prey and Wolfenstein, but Doom is probably his most well-known and acclaimed work. He is coming back for Doom Eternal, which is awesome. The original Doom games had a mix of 70s and 80s inspired heavy metal, with a lot of electronic and orchestral tracks, so the game had a good variety and each track suited the level it was in very well. Now yes, some of the melodies were taken from songs by popular bands like Metallica, but the way they were remixed was awesome. Also fun fact by the way, Bobby Prince, the composer of the original Doom games, was also a lawyer and so he knew exactly how much of another artist's music he could use in the game without breaking copyright laws. Doom 3 didn't have much memorable music aside from the main theme, but that makes sense since the game was more action horror. Doom is always associated with heavy metal, and it's because it fits so well, mainly because of how similar the two are. Doom is loud, Doom is fast, and Doom hits hard. Heavy metal is loud, heavy metal is fast, and heavy metal hits hard. I would go into detail explaining why the soundtrack works so well, but the man himself explains it better than I ever could. The first thing I did was made the riff a little bit lower. When you play the riff back lower, it feels more aggressive already. But I kind of felt that it needed to be lower still. I got a hold of a nine string guitar to go even lower. Then what I was able to do was reconstruct E1M1 using the 9-string guitar while still incorporating those four original notes. The MIDI 
soundtrack of the original Doom did a brilliant job of combining technology with metal. I was inspired by that to kind of see where we could take electronic music in 2016. inspired by these huge monolithic structures that are kind of broken to the point where you can actually see the energy that's holding these structures together. I thought like what would this energy sound like and how could I use that in the music? Electricity is a real tangible thing. You've got electrons bouncing around on a circuit and when you capture that you're capturing a real energy. Like the way this man thinks about the music is unbelievable and this is why pretty much all the soundtracks he makes fits the games really well. He thinks about the universe the game is set in and the scenarios in which the music plays. He could have just created some awesome intense heavy metal for the combat arenas and that would have been fine. But Mick Gordon doesn't make fine music. He makes the best fucking music ever. He shows up to work to make the best shit you've ever heard and he did not disappoint. Of course though, there is one piece of music from this game which has already become one of the most iconic pieces of music in gaming history up there with the original Doom theme. That is of course, BFG Division. The soundtrack is just fucking badass, and there isn't even a word for it, let alone a combination of words. In the end, Doom's single player campaign is fucking brilliant. The gameplay gives a new spin on the classic Doom formula, the story has an interesting amount of lore that doesn't detract from the pace of the game, and the music is fucking godlike. It's one of the best entries in the series, and I cannot wait for Doom Eternal.